part of the reason I think that I love it so much and that right now I'm just like can't shut up about it is because it it really takes away a lot of that potential waste from my kitchen. So there's a little end here from the onions. Normally people would compost them. I put them in a pot and I use them for my stock. Hello and welcome to my signature dish. These are funky drums, aren't they? Uh, my name is Ollie Horn. I'm absolutely delighted that you've decided to listen to this, the very first episode of what I hope to be many in-depth conversations with inspiring home cooks, talking about their love of cooking, sharing their culinary secrets, and describing their signature dish to us. I'm genuinely grateful that you've decided to listen to this first episode, whoever you are, whether you're a pioneering early adopter who's taking a chance on this, uh, or whether you're already at episode 50 and you've decided out of morbid curiosity to trawl back and see how bad the first few episodes were. Um, whoever you are, wherever you are in the world, thank you. Um, you've already heard a little bit of my conversation with Matthew. I really think you're going to get something out of this chat. Matthew's passion and kindness surrounding cooking is infectious. I met him in San Francisco. Uh, he's originally from the Midwest of the USA. And as soon as we met, he was waxing lyrical about all the great local produce that he was working with. He, he found out that the day that we were going to record the interview that I was going to be braising some lamb. So he decided to meet me at his local supermarket, introduce me to his butcher, and he brought along a big jar of homemade stock as a gift. Um, just a super kind gesture, and it shows how much he cares. Um, so this conversation is all about his rather unusual signature dish, and the conversation starts with me asking him how he got into food. I hope you enjoy it. It's serendipitous, honestly. I, I dropped out of college and was living with a girlfriend, and... What were you studying at college? I was in theater. Okay. And then the theater culture wasn't quite for me, so I switched to social psych and philosophy. And I'm more of a continental philosopher, and I was in an analytic philosophy department. And oh, that is the worst. It was oh, not man. a mesh. So I had I, a, I, I had a professor laugh at me uh, about something in a in a, an elevator one day. And he called the philosopher that I was idolizing at the time a clown. And I, you know, I just walked out. I stormed out of the building and and resigned from my college career at that moment. Presumably, and you'd had enough acting training to be able to storm out quite dramatically. It was, it, yeah, it was epic. Everyone was <laughs> clapping for me. <laughs> Very perform, and I still am quite performative. So, um, yeah, I would say I would say it was when she forced me to get a job. I I had a friend working in a restaurant who got me a dishwashing job, and. You know, at the time, let's be honest, I was smoking smoking joints before work and, and you know, we're drinking beers on the job and having a, and having a good time. It was in like a, a gastro pub. We were brewing our own beer. Very much a party vibe. Very much where a young man wanted to be. And I was just watching these guys like make nachos and pizza and, you know, chicken tender sandwiches and just go like, wow, you can get paid? to do that and I'm here in the dish tank you know like scrubbing burnt fucking cheese off of things and yeah essentially cleaning up other people's messes and I said you know what I want to be that guy so I just I want to be making the messes yeah and absolutely. were they good chefs in retrospect absolutely not right they were clowns <laughs> <laughs> but they were my clowns you know and they were that's the thing. It's like in retrospect, you you know, you look back and there's this tendency to be like, oh, well, like, was that the best? No, but it was still a step forward. And for me, it was just about, okay, I, I'm not going to be satisfied here, obviously, washing dishes for the rest of my life. What's next? And what's next? And Kalamazoo is a small town. So once I got that first taste of the line, um, it wasn't so much the food, the quality of the food initially that got me. It was the energy. It was the community. It was the camaraderie. Um, it was being, you know, elbow deep in tickets with people screaming at you and servers storming in and out or a server who likes you bringing you a spiked lemonade, you know, to make it easier for you. It was just, it was just this, it felt like I belonged to something kind of special, this sort of fraternal order of cooks. Um, and it was intoxicating. And what's interesting for me is all of these all of these things which at the time you thought were great about working in a restaurant, right? The busy environment, the stress, you seem to have given all up. Right? I absolutely have, you know. <laughs> so maybe you can you can share with, with the listener what, what you do now. Okay, so now, you know, I would say thir about 13 years later 
after I started this journey. I now own a small private chef business here in San Francisco. Uh, I do restaurant consulting and I do research and development for people who want to design recipes for large-scale production. And yeah, it's not that I dislike the restaurant culture um, entirely. I do think there is a lot of uh, toxic masculinity. There is a lot of uh, sort of abusive working conditions, especially here. Uh, you know, you take advantage of people who have English as a second language, um, who may be here illegally, so you can kind of capitalize on their uh, human resource. But anyways, we don't need to get too deep into that. Um, sure. And, and let, let's just, when I hear the, the word private chef, right, mm -hmm. I think of someone super, super wealthy who's mm -hmm. got a yacht. He's mm -hmm. got like three people cooking them eggs that they could have mm -hmm. cooked themselves. Um, but not all private chefs are dealing with the, like, the elite and the rich, are they? It seems that what you do is, is a lot more accessible. Absolutely. I, I think I personally, I strive to be available for everybody. So if an extremely wealthy person wants to throw a private party for their child's third birthday, I'm there. What are you cooking a three-year-old child for the birthday? I'm not cooking the children any. I'm cooking them hot dogs <laughs> on the grill. But the parents, on the other hand, want the entire spread. So I was in Hillsboro, California, which is a notoriously wealthy area uh, south of San Francisco and we were cooking a what what even was the theme it was unclear to me what the theme was but it was like a, it was like a petting zoo they had brought in animals there were people performing and you cooked those animals yeah I absolutely did we slaughtered them live in front of the children <laughs> to teach them where their food comes from but it was it was insane they had actually asked me can you wear a cowboy hat will you dress up for the part and you know what i said i said absolutely yeah great whatever you want <laughs> because cooking is performative isn't it right it is absolutely performative and you know i'm absolutely convinced that so right we're recording this in the mission district of san francisco famous for the best taquerias uh, in the world maybe outside of mexico uh and i i just you know yesterday when i got some tacos there was a, a mariachi band playing music mm. um when I took, the lady who took my order did not speak English. Absolutely not. Uh, and, so, and so, like I said, you know, carnitas, you know, al polo, or whatever it is. <laughs> uh, and then she asked, like, are you staying in? In Spanish, which I don't speak. Um, but I kind of guessed that that's what she was asking. And I went, see. Sí. Uh, <laughs> but, but just that kind of theatricality, of, right, taking, you know, taking a step into, into Mexico uh, made the burritos more delicious. And that's true. You know, in, in, uh, in Japanese cuisine, you have people that are cooking in front of your eyes right mm -hmm. teppanyaki okonomiyaki it does it does affect the experience and so when you're when you're being a private chef do you feel that you have to kind of play that role sometimes you know and i mean i it, it's a fine line right between people wanting wanting to create some sort of like fun experience for their children and you know and i would say that that experience specifically was was i felt good walking away i didn't i didn't feel like i had been yeah, yeah. you know, dressed up and told to dance like, you know, so. anyways. Uh, but sometimes it is weird, you know, sometimes there still is this expectation. And I think we've all been out to dinner with that person who doesn't treat the server very kind. And we kind of sit back from the table and cringe a little bit going like, hey, who are these people? Why are we here? What is it that we're expecting from them? Um, and that's, a, I think, a big reason why I left the restaurant industry. Um, because like what you're talking about in your mentality is that it is a special performative experience where you become immersed in someone's culture and someone's world and not everybody sees it as that sort of gift. Some people bring their own level of expectation into that. And for me, what I'm really trying to change is people's concept and understanding of food and why it is that we sit around a table with other people and share those meals and what it is that we can gain from those experiences. And, and so let, let's talk about the, the, the private chef work that mm -hmm. you do inside the home because you're not mm -hmm. just doing big events and fancy dinner parties. Definitely not. Um, and and it's, it's fascinating to me that, that people want to kind of bring in an outsider to make their, their home cooking kind of more, more delicious, more authentic. Yeah. So I have this um, concept that I call food literacy. And I think that my food literacy is extremely high because I've been working in professional restaurants for over a decade. 
a lot of people's food literacy comes from watching the Food Network or going over to someone's house to eat or going out to dinner and curiously asking, what's this, what's this, what's this? So when I come into someone's home space, part of what I think I'm doing is help helping them increase their food literacy because they get to observe me cooking in their home. They get to watch me interacting with their tools. They get to see me move throughout their space and they see the raw products come in when I bring them and then they see me packaging all of this beautifully cooked food and I sort of give them like a a rundown of like, hey, you know, this is this kind of braised meat and these greens have been long cooked and these you know, squash have been roasted with beef tallow and thyme. And then I also tell them like, hey, like this is how you warm it up. And these are the combinations. And I think especially in the comfort of their own home, it's a great place to learn. Or who, you know, are, you know, so just so well off and so good and everything's fine for them. And they just, they just recognize the the value of bringing in like fresh organic food prepared with love and care. Um, Are there clients which simply just want you to cook for them in their home? It's interesting. Yeah, I think there are definitely at the, in the beginning, there are people who are just not interested in the mentorship or the quips or, you know, the witticisms, pardon me, uh, the witticisms or, you know, just the story behind the food or how, how to improve as a cook. But eventually since the way that I like, I don't provide meals for people. I provide compartmentalized ingredients. So everything that I provide for someone is separate. It's extremely modular. You build a meal every day. It's going to be different just based on what you open up and look at. Give me an example of a, of a meal that you might be preparing in someone's home. What, what stuff are you doing? What parts of the meal are they cooking? Okay. So I don't do any, um, like staple grains, you know, so there's no, I'm not like boiling any pastas. I'm not cooking any rice. Um, I'm also cooking rice is the hardest thing in the world though. Absolutely. If you don't have a rice (laughs) cooker, you're just going to burn it to the bottom of a pot. If anyone out there is trying still to, uh, cook rice without a rice cooker, I encourage you to spend the hundred dollars. Oh, less than that. Get yourself a rice cooker and it will change your life a hundred percent. Um, yeah, so I, I'll get like five or six different kinds of meat. So I'll do uh, proteins, I should say, chicken, lamb, pork, uh, beef, and turkey. Uh, the turkey's ground. I make meatballs. Uh, the beef is a uh, chuck roast. So I'll braise it with red wine and young garlic and nice hard herbs like rosemary and thyme. Young garlic is one of those things that just, it's a special seasonal gift. It's like a wildflower that you stumble upon on a, on a hike one sunny morning. And it hits you like, like something so fragrant and odd of a story. It's at once. And it looks like a spring onion. It, it absolutely looks like a spring onion. It's at once a leek. It's at once a, an onion, a spring onion, and it's at once garlic. It's all of the most fantastic elements of the allium all sort of rolled up into one. And if you get it at just the right moment, it is so tender and so sweet that you can eat it raw. If you get it uh, young, you can uh, mince it up very finely, uh, throw it in some oil and just barely warm it to kind of take the raw off the garlic and hold it like that preserved in your refrigerator. And it will last you all season if you, if you preserve enough that way and it'll, it'll last you till next year. And then you just take a a spoonful of that gently heated in a, in a saute pan before you're cooking and yeah, uh, try it. It's definitely worth it. So you're taking, so you're taking the proteins, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got the, the fish, the meat, the tofu, whatever it is. So basically you, you deal with the cooking of that. Absolutely. hundred percent. And then I'm also bringing in just a boatload of fresh produce. So whatever is fresh at the market right now, we've got here in California, we're just getting into asparagus season. Uh, we have artichokes. We're doing summer squashes just hitting. Uh, so like the green zucchini squashes, sweet potatoes, cauliflowers, broccolinis, uh, and then a whole bunch of mix of greens. So we have, uh, Swiss chard, uh, kale, um, collards, all stuff like that and sort of just preparing them however I see fit. So the greens, it's, it's always a hard sell trying to get people to eat greens. So I I usually braise them with uh, some chicken stock with uh, some kind of spice and a little bit of garlic, maybe a chili pepper or two. 
you know, blanching all of the brassicas, roasting all of the squashes, really just doing as minimal work as I can in the kitchen to keep the food just tasting like the food. Because And will they be eating this food straight after you've cooked it or are you portioning it up and leaving it for them to, to reheat? Exactly. So what I'll do after I do it is I package it all individually. So the squash stays with the squash. The broccoli romanesco stays with the broccoli romanesco and the braised lamb shoulder stays with the braised lamb shoulder. And when it's dinner time or lunch time, they go into their refrigerator and they build a meal as they see fit out of the elements that and I've prepared. Are you teaching them how to reheat this food? Some, yes. I, I think uh, I've had a lot of success with people who are motivated cooks uh, and motivated um chefs aspiring chefs i should say and uh who just really find a find it hard to go shopping hit the farmers markets and you know i mean good braised meat as you found out the other day and uh it takes four to six hours to make a a good piece of braised meat so the expectation that someone could do that every night or would have the wherewithal or professional experience to braise eight pounds of beef chuck in their oven themselves is you know it's asking a lot and i think what i'm really doing is is a lot of that legwork for them so they can have the fun experience of combining fun flavors with their favorite dishes and and whipping up a meal and so there is presumably opportunity for them to have a certain degree of flair when they're putting these dishes together right if you've part cooked some veg maybe they're sauteing them with a Mm -hmm. And, and is this is this a journey that your clients are kind of taking with you? Some of them, yes. I mean, I, I think you're right in saying that, that there are some people who are just mostly interested in having healthy food. And there are other people who do have culinary aspirations who will send me pictures saying, oh my God, Matt, like, look at this delicious, you know, rice and chicken soup that I made with the leftovers at the end of the week. And then, you know, I offer them like, light critiques like oh that looks good but like what about this and did you put any vinegar in your in your soup because a little bit of vinegar will really just like blow up the flavor i don't know you know yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, yeah. it's kind of fun to just be to start riffing with them as as they become more confident in their own respect and so you, you spend all this time cooking for for other people professionally mm-hmm. what do you cook for yourself what do i cook for myself i mean i eat honestly the same food that I'm providing these people in my, in my, in my private work. So, I mean, then I also like other things, you know, I'm a big burrito fan, like living in San Francisco, you know, California, the home of the burrito. How can you not enjoy a burrito from time to time? Uh, the pizza scene here is pretty dismal. Uh, I wish it was better. Um, but yeah, for me, you know, I, I spend most of the time in my kitchen, just boiling a pot of rice, making a really nice sambal sauce, uh, something like chili based, and then uh, steaming steaming some produce and, and putting some braised meat on there. Excellent. And so this this podcast is about asking people what their signature dish is. Oh, okay. And we go. I mean, you've been waxing lyrical about braising meat yeah. ever since I met you. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have a signature braised meat? Is there one specific... This may come as a surprise, but I would say that my signature dish is not a braised meat. My signature dish actually goes back further than that. And right. maybe some people would would uh, would argue with me that it's not a dish at all, but I think my signature is stock. Okay. Broth. Yes. Stock. Okay. Similar. Very similar. Um, yeah. I stand by that. Well, this... Yeah. I mean, well, this makes a lot of sense because you... You even gave me some of your stock when mm-hmm. I was braising this lamb. Mm-hmm. You said, "Don't don't braise lamb without good stock." Now, for me, if I'm uh, if I'm making a stock or if I need a stock, I do sometimes buy store bought. Uh, which it I'm... happens. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I mean, what 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 do you do to take a stock to the next level? I don't, there's so much to unpack here. This is there is a lot. Well, there's so many different kinds of stocks. So there was a job. Uh, that I had in the city, a wonderful restaurant called Outerlands. If you're ever in San Francisco, please go there for brunch, eat their grilled cheese. You might have to wait in line for an hour and a half, but it is worth it. Um, They also have a spiked apple cider. They mull their own apple cider and spike it with brandy. Can't complain about that. Um, So I was working there and we started making dashi. Okay, yep. And 
I think for me, the Just first... Just for the benefit of the listener, what, uh, what's dashi? Do you want to take a shot at it? No, go, no, go ahead. I'm I mean, gonna... I'll give it a loose... A dashi is usually just like a, a Japanese-leaning broth, um, usually using bonito flakes. So it's like a fish-flavored broth. And then you also use white soy uh, to kind of season it. So you're not using like traditional salt. You're using soy. Yeah, and, and dashi is kind of... It, it's it's a really kind of umami, mm-hmm. slightly fishy... Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's used in so much of so much Japanese cooking, isn't it? Absolutely, it's foundational, and uh, I think that right there is why I would say that stock is my favorite dish. And I think it's that foundational quality for me that makes food really good. Okay. So Let, let's go back to basics. Yeah. What is a stock? I mean, a stock. I think if you were to look up a definition um, on some sort of Wikipedia, w- would say that stock is simply. And I would say there's nothing simple about it, but simply meat and vegetables boiled in water with some kind of herb added uh, to give it aromatic flair. And the stock is that residual liquid. Mm -hmm. So you're just essentially extracting um, all of the flavors from the things that you put in that pot of water and then you discard the solids, strain out all the particulates, and then you're left with just a mostly clear liquid uh, that has a lot of beautiful essence left in it. Okay. And so why why is it important for you to put so much effort into a stock when what people are really experiencing when they're tasting a dish is kind of the top la- layer flavors, right? Mm-hmm. That little, you know, mm-hmm. the chili or the, the meatiness mm-hmm. of the steak. What is it about the stock that's in... That's so important to your cooking. I mean, if I were to offer an analogy, it's why do you want organic, you know, pasture-raised beef? You know, you could have factory-farmed, you know, corn-fed, corn-finished beef, and it would honestly taste very similar. Uh, of course, there are there are differences, and and people with discerning palates will convince you that there are extraordinary amount of differences. But for me, it's it's about uh, a lot of the invisible labor and and things that go into food that most people don't see on that top layer. And for me, stock addresses almost all of those. So it's about kind of taking a dish that would otherwise be sensational to just that next level. It's kind of noticeably absolutely. St- Stopping your tracks delicious. Yeah, or even imperceptibly better. And you go, what is it about this soup that is just so good? Right. And for me, you know, I came up, the, the formative restaurant that I worked at here in San Francisco when I moved here was a place called Zuni Cafe. And I was really saved uh, by a, a woman named Judy Rogers who has since passed away. Uh, rest in power. Um, She's definitely my Tia. Um, She taught me a lot. And there's a bread salad dish at Zuni that is just the most exquisite thing I've ever tasted in my entire life. And it's it's really just bread, pine nuts, currants, and green onions mixed with chicken stock. But the chicken stock that they make at Zuni Cafe, I could drink gallons of it a day. (laughs) It is the most fantastic thing ever. And it's how do you take just bread soaked in stock and baked in an oven and sell it for what they sell it for? It's because it's there's just something about that essence, that that uh, that baseline flavor. Just, uh, you know, it's the foundation that that everything else is built on. OK, so let, let's um, let's find out then what what is the difference between a stock cube, some broth, some stock. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to tell me the difference. Mm-hmm. That, no, you buy okay. in a, that you buy in a store, the stock that I would make, which is just to take a chicken carcass and boil it overnight. Absolutely. And your stocks. Okay, so store-bought stock, you know, what is it, what isn't it? I mean, for me, I think they're really leaning on monosodium glutamate and uh, other forms of sodium. Which is delicious. I'm not going to lie. And in a pinch, it's really great. And, you know, I bought, I bought some some olives the other day that had monosodium glutamate in them and I ate the entire jar. <laughs> My brain was very pleased. Well, of course you did. You ate one. You're like, I need to finish these. Yes. I just yeah, chugged I them off. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that's cool. But I think it's sort of a cheap trick, right? Uh, the store-bought cubes, the bouillon, whatever you want to call it. Um, so wh- what is in these cubes? I mean, it depends. You know, I'm not saying that you can't find like really nice, you know, freeze-dried, powderized stock, you know. Yeah. Um but 
like anything that's mass produced, it's it's where where are these onions coming from? Where is this garlic coming from that they're they're drying and powderizing and then pressing into these cubes? Um, so I mean that's the thing. That's it's sort of the same ingredients every every step of the way. But you know, I would challenge anyone to think about the difference between you know the four dollar steak um, that's mass produced Mm -hmm. and the $30 steak that's cooked by a professional. And I think with anything, there's, there's definitely like a level of quality there. Okay. So fundamentally what goes into the store-bought stock is going to be the same base ingredients, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever, um, meat carcass they're using, whatever vegetables they're using. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Carcass. (laughs) (laughs) And you know, say you were to buy a better stock, right? So say, for example, a stock that comes in a carton that's already mm-hmm. liquid, is that likely to be better? Yeah, I think so. You know, there are there are definitely like butcher shops here that you can buy what they're calling now bone broth, yeah. which don't believe the hype. It's just stock people. Uh, and it's definitely better. You know, it's fresher. It, it hasn't been processed as heavily. I think your body responds to it um, on a nutritional level better. And, you know, you're supporting people who are local to you, which I also think is a value add. Um, but so I think what I'm realizing is, is what I'm trying to say is that there are, it's sort of like a level of freshness. It's a level of human connection and a level of artistry. So for me, that store-bought stock, did they roast the chicken bones before they made the stock? I don't know. Maybe they did. There's no guarantee and there's no guarantee that there weren't burnt bits in it. So for me, when I'm making a stock for my clientele, I'm really just micromanaging that process. I'm using all of the freshest seasonal aromatics that are that are available to me. And uh, you're using the ingredients that you use in your stock would be ingredients that you would otherwise use regularly in a normal dish, right? The, the onions which you're using, you'd happily use. Oh yeah, and 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 I would say that part of the reason I think that I love it so much and that right now I'm just like can't shut up about it is because it it really takes away a lot of that potential waste from my kitchen. So if there's a little end here from the onions. Normally people would compost them. I put them in a pot and I use them for my stock. Brilliant. And, and of course, that's what's great about a stock, right? That, you know, say, for example, when I when I cook a roast chicken, I will spatchcock it, mm-hmm. remove the backbone. Mm-hmm. What do you possibly, what can you possibly do with that backbone other than make a, a stock out of it, right? And it Oh, maybe you've got an idea then. I can see your brain's whirring. Yeah, but that's not what we're talking about. We'll no, move God, on. No, tell me. What no, do you, no, no. What do, you well, do I was going to say, I was gonna say the only thing that you can get out of the back really is the oysters. And you should always be trying to get the oysters out of the back of the chicken. So it's just these two little yeah. beautiful nubs of dark meat that sort of live above the hip bones of okay. the chicken. So, And would I likely be cutting these off if I'm cutting the backbone off? No, what you kind of have to do is, uh, is you'll throw them all on a sheet tray with some salt and pepper into the oven to roast them pre-stock. And then when they come out of the oven, you'll just scoop them out with your fingers and just eat them. Talk me through your your stock, your signature stock. Yeah, let's pick one. So I usually, let's chicken, we're on chicken. It's easy. I break down a lot of chickens for a lot of people. Everyone loves it. So um, I, I do two versions. Let's do the non-roasted. And uh, yeah, you start with chicken carcasses, cold water, as cold as you can, and salt. Um, so let's break all three of these down. Because uh, this isn't this this isn't intuitive to people that don't care about stock absolutely. As much as Thank you, do. you. Yeah, keep me so, <laughs> keep me keep me real. So, so, so a chicken a chicken carcass is everything mm-hmm. that isn't the meat that we're going to eat. Is that right? Absolutely. And I and I'm not going to lie to anybody. I use the neck. I use the livers. I use like so. Usually, when you get a whole chicken, you'll get giblets yep. packed inside of the the carcass of the chicken. If you're not going to cook the liver to eat it. Put it in your stock. If you're not going to cook the neck to like shred the meat off of it, put it in your stock. If you're not going to use the heart, just put it in your stock. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of like mineral content in there uh, that's good for you. And I think it also adds for me, what I really love is this like gamey yeah. kind of undertone to the to the stock flavor. And it's just kind of a matter of respect. I mean, if you, you're going to persuade a chicken to go through the indignity of dying so we can eat it. I do think I do strongly believe that the least we can do is to use all of the animal. Absolutely. If we're, if we're minded to eat meat, we should we should do so by committing to eating meat. I couldn't agree with you more. And so so you're taking basically anything that you're not carving up separately to, to put on the plate. Mm-hmm. 
that goes in your water, mm-hmm. right? And we're using just tap water? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, know your water. If you live in a place where tap water is not uh, maybe the cleanest or the best water source, you know, you can just buy uh, bulk bottle, bottled water or something like that. But I think we're blessed here in San Francisco to have pretty good water, so I'm comfortable with it. And why is it cold? Because the temperature change from cold to hot will actually help to dry out any of the, what I call scuzz, or the impurities of the chicken carcass. So as it comes up and you're approaching a boil, you will notice that there is like a a bit of foam that is sort of collecting on the top of the pot. And you want to very carefully strain that off. So that's not good, that foam? You don't want that foam. Um, What's in that foam? I don't know. (laughs) I've never had it tested. But um, I guess it's conventional wisdom that's been passed down to me uh, in the kitchen is that, you know, like any like any animal in any animal that's been processed. um, There's some impurities. There's some. Yeah. Yeah. And and the conventional wisdom there is that that scuzz, as I like to refer to it, is usually something that doesn't add to the overall flavor of yeah. the stock. So okay. it may serve to add bitterness later if you allow it to reincorporate. It may also add cloudiness yeah. to your stock, which, you know, for the home cook may not matter, but for a professional cook, that's always a consideration. Okay. And so you're, you're bringing it up to, to boil kind of slowly, so you get a chance to, to allow this, this, to, this foam to develop. Mm-hmm. You take that off. And at what stage are we adding that third ingredient, the salt? Uh, from the beginning. Okay. So, so usually what I do is is add the chickens into an empty pot, put a put a nice amount of salt in, a uh, nice amount meaning you know you can do two or three tablespoons per gallon of water. Okay. Um, Quite a lot then. And absolutely. This is regular salt, culture salt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you're not roasting the chicken before you put it in the in the water. You can. You can. That's that's the that's the that's level two. You, well, it just it adds a different um, quality, I would say. Okay. Uh, you can also roast the veg that you would that we'll talk about in a second. So it's just, yeah, it's up to you. In a sentence, what might that do to the to the flavor if you were to roast the chicken before you were to put it in the water? Sweetness. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, when you, when you caramelize anything, you're kind of like roasting the sugars that are naturally present and you just, yeah, you add a little bit of a sweeter quality. So say you didn't have carrots to add to your chicken stock, you could just roast your chicken bones and then you would end up with a, with a sweeter stock. Very interesting. So, uh, we, we've brought this to the boil. Mm-hmm. Like a really aggressive rolling boil, or a- no, sir. So uh, you'll notice the scuzz is is forming right as we're approaching a boil. As soon as you start to see uh, simmering, you want to turn your temperature back down to medium, and you want to add your vegetables. So let's just keep it simple and use like a traditional French mirepoix. So you're doing carrots, celery, and onions. I actually have a tattoo here on my right forearm. Oh, wow. Okay, so you've got 2-1-1. Yeah, 2 one, one, which is the traditional weight ratio, just in case I'm ever, you know, Amazing. too intoxicated while I'm cooking to remember what's going on. So that's two parts of onion? Yes. To one part celery, one part carrots? Yes, by weight. Amazing. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you just, you, and what I do is uh, I, depending on your carrot, if you're getting really nice farm fresh carrots that are sweet, you can leave the skins on. But a lot of times if you're buying store-bought carrots, you'll want to peel them because the skins tend to be bitter. Uh, and of course the celery, we're, we're just washing, washing it. And, and then the onions we're chopping in the onions. Yeah. You just take off like the outermost papery skin and then the rest of it you can leave and just rough chop, put all that in a couple bay leaves, uh, small handful of peppercorns and, uh, yeah. Before we move on to these aromatics, let's talk about this veg then. So yeah. the, the veg, in terms of a, like an overall quantity, if you're mm-hmm. using, say, one or two chicken carcasses in your stock, mm-hmm. how much veg in real terms might we be using? I would say if if we're just like eyeballing by volume compared to the, the amount of chicken carcass that you have, you'd want to go like 10 to 1 chicken carcass to vegetable. Okay, so, so really you're... You're prioritizing the chicken. Absolutely. That makes sense. And so once you, we've added all these vegetables, mm-hmm. presumably the temperature is going to drop. Mm-hmm. Do we then have to wait for it to come back to... Yeah. And that, this is where you kind of want to baby things. Um, you know, you turn it down to prevent it from boiling. 
the main reason that you don't want the the stock to boil is because it will start emulsifying the fat that is forming on the top of the pot. So, you know, if you were going to make like a, a chicken broth for like ramen, you know, yeah. all, all broths for like ramen is they're all emulsified. So it's like a little bit of a deviation here. Uh, into different right, cultures. Of course, of course. See, of this course. is why this is why stock yeah, yeah. is my favorite yeah, food. <laughs> so my my favorite uh, ramen is is tonkotsu ramen. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I lived in. Uh, I, I can't stop going on about it, but I lived mm. in the south of Japan, Kyushu, which is the home of tonkotsu ramen, which is a pork pork bone broth. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered how kind of the fattiness kind of stayed in the soup. Do you know what uh -huh. I mean? Oh yeah. Right. How when you take a bite, can you almost taste this 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 fat content right and so it must be it must be that it must be what we're talking about they must be producing their their broth stock okay let's pause here yeah <laughs> what, what's the difference between a broth and a stock so i would say that a stock is is just this water that has been imbued with with this okay with the flavor of you know, whatever, meat, vegetable, whatever. Very simple. I think a broth is sort of the next step of saying we've, you know, strained everything out and we've decided what the application is going to be. And now we're sort of moving it yeah, in that yeah, direction. Yeah. So if I'm seasoning it with a bouquet of herbs or I'm adding wine to it or I'm emulsifying the fat into it. And presumably that's what they're doing then for, for this Tom hundred percent, exactly. And that's when it becomes a broth because it's really now it's... Interesting, okay. It's something in and of itself. Stock is just so open to going any direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But kind of going back to this really basic chicken stock we're making. So we've mm -hmm. we've put this veg in. Mm -hmm. The temperature is pretty constant now. And the bay leaves and the black peppercorns. So I was going to say, so now we're adding these aromatics, right? Absolutely. And your arm, in addition to having a 2-1-1, you've also got a load. You've got, what can I see? Half a half a lemon or orange, is that lemon? Yeah, citrus, um, you know, generally speaking. You've got some, some kind of leaf. These are bay leaves. Bay leaves. Uh, you've got a, a, a fish bone. Yep. Uh, you've got, is that a steak? No, this is a rabbit's. This is a rabbit skull, and then I have a guinea hen skull. Okay, that's more clear over from here. that angle. Um, so ba basically, for for the sake of the listener, I'll try and get a picture of this. But we've got like a dozen different ingredients tattooed on Matt's arm, uh, and all of these look like they're going to make a delicious stock. Absolutely. So is this, is this what that is? Yeah, this is just my recipe. And then this one here, actually, another sidebar is a is a recipe for vinaigrette and alchemical oh rune my symbols. Goodness. Because why not, right? If, if ever you publish a cookbook, you just, just need to do a nude photo shoot. Yeah, it's just going to be a picture of my naked body. Goodness me. Okay, so, 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 so let's talk about these aromatics then. So you're okay. adding bay leaves? Yes. Uh, let's talk about these aromatics. You're adding bay leaves? Yes. Uh, you're adding, did you say peppercorns? Black peppercorns. Tell a cherry peppercorns if you can find them. Okay, what's the difference? Uh, it's just classically uh, sort of the Mediterranean vibe. Someone out there is going to be like, no, it's not. It's This is where it's from. Oh, um, okay. So Telecherry is just kind of, for me, the, the quintessential sort of like what I use in my French style yep. chicken stock, which is what I'm describing to you And you're now. putting these black peppercorns in whole. You're not crushing them or? Not, nope. Not toasting them. Not doing anything. Okay. And is there anything else we need to add? Nope. And then how long are we leaving this to, to simmer for? That's the hard one. This is, and this is where I think it, it really becomes an interactive experience because you just need to be tasting. You'll start to smell. You'll have a smell sensation first, I think. And you'll say, oh, wow, like you'll leave your house. You'll come back as this is simmering. Uh, sidebar, I call it a champagne simmer, which if you've ever just watched a glass of champagne, it's barely bubbling. And I would say if you apply the same sort of premise to your chicken stocks you will never have a problem with anything um so yeah you just taste it you know you'll start to smell it you go oh man you know i came back in my house spent a couple hours smells really good in here and just taste it with a spoon um i, I guess it's easy for you to say oh you just smell it mm -hmm. right but what what judgment are you using to work out whether this is ready to go whether it needs a few more hours whether you've already ruined it yeah, well, so the reason that I think you start smelling it is because you're actually evaporating out 
some of uh, the terpenes or some of the uh, essential oils that are existing, some of the fats are evaporating off the top of the pot. So you're going, oh, okay, like, cool. We've like, we've extracted enough of this flavor into the, into the water that we're now evaporating that flavor out. Um, Right. Okay. So so there's a critical point where it stops just being water that's evaporating. Exactly. Okay. That makes sense. And then you'll know, okay, we've crossed over the threshold. Yeah. We've created a stock Interesting. now. Interesting, okay. And um, and then it's about hitting peak flavor. And the only way you can really know peak flavor is by tasting it. Um, so, yeah, it's going to vary, you know. If you do – so for me, let's just pick six. If you do a stock made out of six chicken carcasses, I would say it's going to take you five and a half hours at a light simmer before you get a nice um, – a nice chicken stock. Are you ever putting a lid on, by the way? Never. No, okay. Um, Why is that? Because I just don't. I mean, I think some people have their own personal philosophies about it. I like to allow some of the some of the water to evaporate out and to sort of concentrate yeah. uh, the flavor of the stock. Is it completely wrong to just say, look, I'm going to be really lazy about this. I've just, uh, you know, roasted a pork shoulder. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to stick it in a pot with water. Any skins like any veg i've got left over just chuck it all in Mm -hmm. put it on the lowest heat my uh hob goes and just leave it overnight like is is that is that in your eyes a complete disaster waiting to happen no and i would say you know you you run some risk uh structurally to the home that you're living in and uh if i could offer an alternative suggestion would be to use a crock pot I think, uh, you know, a crock is really great. It's induction heated. You run zero risk of lighting anything on fire or burning anything down. Okay, so <laughs> so, okay, so aside from the health and safety risks. <laughs> yes, no. Let's talk about what, what might be produced inside this this pot. Is like Basically, what I'm trying to ask is, if I, if I make my stock for like 24 hours, let's say, yeah. right, I'm just super lazy about it. I just say, it will definitely be done by then. Mm-hmm. Am, I, am I likely to produce a good result? You are. And I would say the only problem there would be what some people refer to as a bony quality, which yep. is uh, like an over extraction of, of the, the bones. Um, and it goes, again, like most things in cooking, once you take it too far, it starts to get bitter. And that's the only issue that you're worried right. uh, about there. Okay, so uh, we've we've worked out that the stock's ready. Mm-hmm. What do we do next? Uh, you turn the heat off and you strain it somehow. Um, there's a lot of different options here. Uh, I like a colander. I find a colander that fits very nicely into the top of my pot. Uh, the kind of wedges down in there so that when I when I pour things out, it kind of holds all of the solid matter yeah. into the pot. And are these like quite, is this a colander? When I think of a colander, I'm thinking of quite big holes. Perfect. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So for the initial strain, we just want like the big chunks of vegetable, the big chunks of meat or bone to stay inside. The bay leaves, little particulates, little chunks of skin, little bits of meat are going to get through right now. And that's fine. Um I'd, I go through personally several different levels of uh, straining depending on what I'm using it for. So some some things I just really don't use a strained uh, broth at all for, or sorry, a strained stock for at all. Can you give some examples then of recipes? I guess filtered would be a better word. Uh, yeah, like if I'm making a, like a bread salad, I don't mind if there's like chunks of little meat bits. and yeah, little nice. bits of skin and things like that. A random peppercorn here and there to just add some sort of excitement to it. And is this how, how it happened at the Zumi Cafe? Yes. Um, and then, you know, if I'm making like a soup, like a nice clean soup, you know, I will really strain the stock and filter it through cheesecloth. So, yeah, just pour it into a receptacle. Um, and then how long will that last for? It depends, you know. Um I would say, you know, don't don't pour it in anything plastic because plastic is a great insulator of heat. So you'd want to strain your stock into something metal uh, so that it cools down quickly. Yep. And you can freeze it. Um, you can portion it out into whatever you want and you can freeze it and it will last almost indefinitely. A tip that I heard is you, uh, you, you can pour stock in ice cube trays. Absolutely. And then you can just take one or two for when you're, mm-hmm. you're making them. And that's perfect for, you know, if you want to, you know, reheat some vegetables in a skillet and you want to steam them, you can just throw one of those ice cubes in with the vegetables, put a lid on it, put it on medium heat and boom, you're good. And, uh, and so let's say 
uh, let's say you want to show off your stock, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to really impress someone with, with what your stock can do. Mm -hmm. What dish are you going to use it for? I think, I think for me, like a nice simple soup is the best, you know, like, uh, like a rice and vegetable soup mm. is people will, will taste it and they will be very surprised when they eat it. And it's like, Oh, like there's only celery root and parsnips in this soup. And why does this taste so good? And you say, well, the chicken stock that I made, you know, it's the best. Um, and you prepare that for the soup by, you know, reheating it with a bouquet of softer herbs. Um, so for me, that would be maybe chives, chervil, um, maybe tarragon, stuff like that. And uh, a little bit of citrus, perhaps uh, some salt and a splash of nice wine, some red wine, uh, whatever, whatever it is that you like. Uh, yeah. And I think it just, it's just really, people can taste that you spent hours and hours and hours babying so. this. And even if the soup really only takes you like 45 minutes to put together, there's just so much flavor and packed in there. Incredible. Okay. Well, uh, final question I'm going to ask is what's the, what's the most adventurous stock you've either ever created or ever thought about? Oh, no. How can you take this stock to the next level? What's going to be the, uh, the stock that goes on your tombstone? For me, the, the point of stock is that it isn't adventurous. The point of stock that it is that it is so mundane and basic and approachable that you can use it for anything. Uh, but maybe, you know, to, to answer that slightly differently is what is the craziest application? Yeah, yeah. That I've ever that I've ever done with a stock is, uh, and I didn't think this was going to work. And you know, a lot of people out there are going to roll their eyes and go, "How is this crazy? This doesn't sound crazy at all to me." But was uh, I, I I read this really great book. It's called Honey from a Weed, uh, and I'm blanking on on who the author is, but it's essentially a story of a woman who travels around the Mediterranean region with her husband, who who is a potter, and there's a recipe for beans in this book and the way that she's cooking the beans is kind of by putting everything that you're going to want in a clay kind of cooking vessel and putting it on a real gentle hearth and just letting it cook for like hours and hours and hours so that when the beans are completely cooked there's no liquid left it's just okay. beans and everything that you put in there and um i was living in italy and we were butchering a lot of pigs. I was I was doing a, a sort of a charcuterie apprenticeship over there. And so I just had so many pork bones. I was making all kinds of pork stock. <laughs> it was a glorious yeah, time of my life. Have, yeah. yeah. And uh, I was like, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this bean thing. And, and, you know, usually I cook beans with water. And I was like, no, like this time I'm going to do it with this pork stock. And it was like a fresh trotter. Yeah, goes in all this pork stock, all this like wonderful veg that we picked from the garden. And I kind of did what you said. I just put it in a, in a pot. Unfortunately, it wasn't clay and just put it on the edge of the fireplace you before I went it. to bed. And I just woke up in the morning expecting it to be gross yeah. and weird and kind of disastrous. But when I, you know, and I don't eat beans in the morning and my mouth is watering right now just describing this, but I just lifted that lid off it in the morning and it just this most pungent, fragrant, porky, beany thing just hit me in the face. And I was just like, I fell in love in that moment. Um, it was fantastic. Wow. That was Matthew. I really enjoyed talking to him. He, oh, he's the real deal. He put so much thought into his food. Uh, the quality of the stock that he gave to me was just exceptional. It was so flavorful, so silky. I mean, this guy, he is the real deal. And goodness me, I hope that you've been inspired to make your own stocks now. I hope that you've taken your stock cubes and put them straight in the bin after listening to that conversation. Uh, by the way, the book that he recommended, Honey from a Weed, it's by an author called Patience Gray. I've just ordered my copy. Uh, the reviews online seem incredible, so I'm very, very excited for that to arrive and to get stuck into that. Uh, all that's left to say is thank you very much to you for taking a chance on this first episode. It's really hard to start a new thing, and so it does rely on people like you who are going to take a chance on it, and I'm genuinely grateful. I am going to ask just one favour from you. If you enjoyed this and you think you might like to listen to future conversations, please subscribe 
to this podcast, wherever you're listening to it. I'd love for you to listen to the next episode, which will be next week. So until then, goodbye. Guys.